some of the machining strategies um, that you should consider as well too. You definitely have to have um, intelligent tool paths. Constant chip load is vital to uh, you know using the tool the most efficient way. Again, I'm, I'm going to say several times the knowledge of the stock. Where do I go? How much do I cut? And, and feed optimization. What happens when you get into that extra couple of tenths of material? Do you want to just continue moving on at the same feed, or do you want to slow down? Tool control. You have to be able to cut these parts. You know, at 80 Rockwell, you can't just cut it like you normally cut anything else. You have to attack it slowly, and you have to have the most efficient tool path. The tool motions. Um, you know, high-speed machining options where you have the tricotal or rounding corners, rounding rapids. All of this is vital when you're cutting with these small tools. Um, clean between passes, clean between layers. Uh, knowing all of the information about the stock and where to go is real important, but also the motion to get there. Now back to the knowledge of the remaining stock. You know, when you throw one tool at it and then you go to another tool, you don't have to create boundaries or remember or what some people end up doing is cutting the whole job with the smallest tool and cutting it very slow because they don't want to try and figure out where they have to go or forget an area. Um, again, the less operator in interaction when you when the system knows what's been cut and what hasn't been cut. Again, uh, tool holder and spindle tracking. You want to use the, the most efficient tool that you can. In this particular picture here, you can see that the tool is not getting all the way down to the bottom of that pocket. You don't want to end up cutting the whole job with a real long tool and cut it slow and, and you know worry about the tool breaking. So, you know, the CAD and CAM system has to be able to say, I'm going to take the short tool, I'm going to cut everything I can, but when I grab the long tool, I'm only going where the short tool couldn't go. So the short tool can get 80% of the job, maybe even a little bit more, 90, 90%. The long tool can get the areas that that couldn't reach. It's much more efficient on the machining times, and you're not relying on the programmer to remember to go back and get every little area. Um, also with the uh, multi-axis, with the five axis, again, these real small tools, you're, you're attacking these parts in different angles, different directions. You, uh, a lot of times you have to to get better surface quality. Also, again, once you start tipping your tool and moving around the part, you better know where that stock is. So if you cut it from one side and go to the other side, you know, the software must be able to know that, hey, that's all gone. I don't have to waste time cutting air. Now, if we take a few minutes and, and look at um, some examples and some tool path strategies, um, I'll turn it over to John. Hello, everybody. Okay, so I've got just a couple of examples today. Um, the first one that I have here, uh, I've got some dimensions on the screen so you can see uh, how big the part is. Uh, not terribly big, not, uh, let's see, if I, if I zoom in on this area, you can see that along the uh, outer perimeter of the part, I'm going to have to have a cutter that's going to be less than 10 thousandths to get inside there. But obviously, uh, there's areas where bigger tools can go. So we're going to kind of whittle, whittle it away with a series of cutters. And um, I've got just three in this example right here that we're going to calculate live. Uh, so let me go ahead and launch this first one. Okay, so the first uh, tool path is uh, 30 thousandths flat, and it goes in and it uh, roughs out this center area. Uh, but obviously, the tool is too big to get into these other areas, and we'll point that out a little bit better in a second. Uh, 
let me open up the second one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my tool library. And this is a 20,000 spall cutter. Uh, I can get a feel for the size of that tool if I position it on the part, uh, just to kind of understand, it. is this tool really going to be able to fit into these areas? Uh, but this is only one of a couple ways that we can uh, determine whether or not this tool is the right size for the task. Um, in fact, before I show you that, let me just point out one thing. Um, being that we're doing the micro milling, uh, you'll see that my decimal places here are uh, six places. Uh, so when it comes to the amount of material that I want to leave or the step down, um, we can get uh, all the way down into six decimal places for those types of parameters. But what I want to show here is the uh, preview. Now, this particular uh, procedure has not been calculated yet. Uh, and even so, we can look at some things. Let me just open this window up a bit more. If I look at the previous stock, this shows me what the last tool left for this procedure to cut. And I can also look at the remaining stock. This would be uh, a preview of what this is going to look like if I were to calculate this program with the settings that I've chosen. So you can see that it's showing us that it's getting into some of these areas. And then lastly, we can also see the uh, excessive material. And this points out uh, where that tool is going to encounter some heavy areas. So let's go ahead and calculate this one. And you'll notice that, uh, like Ralph was saying, I haven't uh, had to draw any boundaries or tell the tool where to go and where not to go. Uh, the system uh, is taking care to track the stock. Um, so you'll see that, for example, in the center area where the 30,000s flat was able to go, uh, obviously, I don't have more roughing motions there. Uh, but over here, obviously, the 30,000s flat didn't go there, so I am getting these roughing motions. But still, the tool is too big to really get into the ends of the veins. Uh, it's going down a bit out here, uh, but we're still a long ways from finishing uh, this outer perimeter in the teeth of the gear. And let's execute this one. And while we're waiting for that, I'll uh, elaborate a bit more on the tool library. Um, like Ralph was saying, for the tool library, we can have specific libraries for various materials so that uh, in micro-milling, there's so much testing uh, goes on to have the appropriate downstep, sidestep, RPM, and feed rate. And uh, the tool suppliers actually do a great job of supplying the, the recommend, recommendations. Uh, and once you're satisfied that those uh, parameters work, you're able to store all that data in the tool library, uh, and it's accessible uh, at any time by right-clicking in the software and saying, uh, bring this information into the procedure. And of course, that's in addition to the standard templates that we, that we normally would use. OK, so here's the third tool path. And th the same thing holds true. You can see that. Uh, in the bigger area of this vein, it knows that material is gone. Uh, so the roughing is uh, just staying in the areas that have not been roughed out yet and where this tool can go. But even here, you'll see that I'm down to a 10,000 spall cutter, and still there's areas that haven't been machined out. Um, so rather than keep going through all this, I'm going to open up another file where I already have that done. And this would be the next procedure, where we're now going down to an 8,000 spall cutter, uh, still using a roughing strategy. And you can see that this one also, uh, it knows what areas have been done and what areas haven't. So it's uh, taking the material out from the ends of these veins and in between uh, the short area of the perimeter and at the very end of the teeth. So now we've successfully uh, roughed this all out down to an 8,000 spall cutter. And the next procedure uh, is the 8,000 spall cutter um, using uh, surface milling by limit angle strategy. Uh, what that one does is that 
it kind of looks at this differently based on uh, horizontal and vertical areas. So you can see that across here in the more vertical areas, I have a by layer path, like a Z layer uh, strategy. And then in the more horizontal areas, I get a spiral collapse. And it is a very nice path. Now, this one technically did take it to zero, uh, but just to um, reiterate some of the things that Ralph was saying about tool control, uh, I made a couple of more examples here. Uh, this one is going to be a, a spiraling tool path. Um, you can see that my tolerance is set to 25 millionths. And uh, it's, a, it's a true spiral, so there's no connections between lanes. And I also made an example here of a, a standard tool path with the same strategy. The only difference between these two is that this one is calculated with a 2 tenths tolerance, uh, which in most cases would be a pretty tight tolerance. But compared to 25 million, uh, it's not so much. So now I turn on the uh, 2 tenths tolerance. We'll go to a top view, and we'll zoom in here so you can get a real feel for the difference here in the tool path. You can see that the red cord length uh, is much more, is a much longer cord length than uh, the yellow micro-milling path. Uh, so that's the difference between micro-milling and a standard uh, milling at a two-tenths tolerance. Uh, this one is our um, morphine between two curves. And what I'm doing is I'm machining this vein, and I'm giving it a guide curve on the left and a guide curve on the right, and doing a morph between the two uh, to give a nice uh, finish in each of those veins. And then lastly, I have the uh, remachine cleanup. Now, the remachine cleanup also uh, has no use for boundaries. Uh, it's able to go in and accurately see what areas need to be remachined uh, based on knowledge of previous cutter as well as previous stock. I think the one thing to note on this, too, is uh, if you show that tool path again, John, um, yeah. the system is intelligent enough to know what's vertical and what is horizontal. So it's going to do the verticals in a Z-level manner, and then it's going to flow along uh, you know, the floor all the way along because that's more horizontal uh, cut. Yep. OK, I've just got uh, one more example here. And this, this one is one of my personal favorites. Uh, it's our ability to maintain sharp edges. Uh, and I think it's pretty cool. Basically, in an example like this, we've got these little triangles that we need to machine. Uh, and if you can imagine uh, a small cutter, we're running around these guys. There's an excellent chance that you could be rounding off the corners. Uh, if this needed to stay nice and sharp, uh, the appropriate way to program this would, of course, be two-dimensional. Uh, where you could have a, a lead in, cut across that length, and a lead out. And then, again, a lead in, cut across that length, and a lead out. I think everyone would agree that's the appropriate strategy uh, for this type of situation. And we can do it in a, in a uh, 3D environment. Uh, basically, what we do is we define the sharp edges. I'll just quickly go into this one and show you that what I've done is I've selected all these vertical edges being sharp. So when I calculate this, and let me just go ahead and uh, go to the navigator and I'll play it for a second so you can see. As the tool comes down, it's going to do just like we would in a 2D environment. It's going to arc in, it's going to cut that length, arc off, and then do the same thing for each subsequent edge. And we have this ability not only with the vertical sharp edges, uh, but also the horizontal sharp edges, which is handled a bit differently. But any sharp edge that we define in the software, uh, the system is careful uh, not to round it off. Not, not that the software would round it off, but sometimes uh, you know, various combinations of things can work against you to, you know, round corners off. Um, I'll turn it back over to Ralph at this time. 